All right, welcome back, guys. Um, if you could just do me a favor, go ahead and create a new session. Your startup procedures today is going to be class 11. Um, I'll let you know what we're going to do once we get there. Oh, Chad, one thing uh, in addition that we did is we also covered um, uh, bouncing or exporting to bounce. And you had already done exporting. You were here for exporting MIDI, right? When you, with the week before? I think so, yeah. Okay, what I'd like for you to do um, immediately once you get your um, your session set for class 11, go ahead and make a brand new stereo instrument um, and actually create a uh, expand to plugin. So you'll actually make a stereo instrument track. And uh, unlike last week and week before where we used Boom and we used, um, gosh, whatever that synthesizer was, um, today we're gonna use expand to, so it'll be under the instrument plugin list. So as soon as you get in, go ahead and set it up. I'll show you how it's done once everybody's kind of there. And then we'll jump into some notes about what we're going to do today. But I want to make sure that you have that. Make sure it makes sound. Uh, once you get it, make sure you got some juice coming out of it. And if you don't, raise your hands so that we're all on the same page before we start on this next procedure. Good weekend, right? Did you guys have fun? The weather was kind of dull, but, you know, oh well. It's going to get better soon. Uh, okay, so command shift in. And then I'm going to jump down to a stereo instrument track. And I only need one. Uh, let's see, for today, I think it might be good to make in, in expand too. And you can see, actually, let me zoom this in just a touch so you can see it. Creating a new virtual instrument is pretty easy, so you're going to go and make sure your multi-channel plug-in, and it's in stereo. And then you go to expand to. Um, what I'm going to have us do is actually choose some strings to work with this morning, so we can get into some of the stuff we're going to do with MIDI today. So today we're talking about MIDI editing, and we're going to be talking about uh, the score editor a little bit. Uh, if you get this warning, all you have to do is hit browse, and just make sure in the folder that says air music technology you choose the expand to folder and you can just hit choose should rectify the situation for you once you're in expand actually you can do this might be fun to spend a little bit of time in but once you're in expand just raise your hand and give me a wave that way at least I know you can awesome Uh, for those of you who are in it, go ahead and navigate. If you see here, on, there's like a, a little drop down here where it says bright pads, massive pad. If you click on that, go ahead and navigate down to strings. It's in 014 strings. You can choose, you know, realistically any kind of string you want, but you might actually want a something that's got a little bit of zip on it. So let's see. Ooh, what do they have? Oh, they only have spiccato. Do we not have staccato? Oh, you know what? I'm going to use spiccato up and down. This one that says spiccato strings up, down, plus. The reason I'm going to choose this is if I choose a slow string, it's going to limit my ability to show you just some of the stuff that we're going to do. So you can choose any of the spiccatos. Uh, I would avoid tremolo or any of the, I don't think they have the gliss strings on these, but maybe not the slow strings, which are the... Uh, legato, anything that says legato, so maybe avoid that. But you can choose anything you'd like. Uh, I'm going to open up the this uh, spiccato string up down. Let me just make sure I have something coming out. Um, go ahead and record it. Enable that track in order to be able to begin using it. The cool part about this is uh, this is a sample engine, so this isn't a synthesizer. So um, 
the the sound engine here with the plugins a sample engine so what it does is they actually just record little short samples and then they assign it to these keys so they're play they're played back based on what you play the cool part about this one is it's bow up and down which means it's alternating um, uh, bow sounds so like if you play a note twice the second time it sounds different versus it just being the same each time which means you could do you know not nice little kind of arpeggiated kind of systems um, we're going to talk about how this system set up a little bit as we go but go ahead and make sure you have some juice uh, record and enable it make sure that you have some sound coming through. And then once you've done that, go ahead and double click the nameplate, title the track strings before we go into what we're about to do. So, uh, you know, you can do it in the mix window or in the edit window where it says instrument one, title it strings. Uh, so if you don't mind, just create a, a new session for today, class 11, you can make a stereo instrument track and put the expand to virtual instrument on. All right, and if you need help, just give me a shout out. So far, are you guys okay? After record enabling, is anybody not having audio? Or anybody not get audio? Everybody has audio then? Everybody's fighting through? Good? Okay. Okay, so uh, we're going to jump into some steps here. And, um, you know, I want to give you, I'll give you a little bit of time to kind of work with the sound and stuff like that. Let me just mention a couple things about the Expand 2. Um, you know, when it comes to virtual instrument technology, there's typically two things that, they, that they're that they really pushing um, that are really commercial or viable for people who use them. One is capability, uh, just what can the device do, and two is what are the sounds, you know, so how good does it sound. On a capability standpoint, expand the Expand 2 actually has some really uh, awesome capabilities, uh, and it has a lot of extensive capabilities. Uh, it does not allow you to script though. So like a lot of the native instruments things allow you to actually write script directly for the, the plugin, which is like a whole other realm or world, but it's something that's very useful for people who use virtual instruments. It allows them to, to kind of dive in deeper into the technology instead of just what they're giving on hand. So this does have a, a, like essentially like a closed system. Uh, so what you, what you get is what you get, but there's a lot of options for it. On the, on the sound side, sounds are okay to, to pretty good sometimes depending on what you're playing. I like the big orchestral like uh, drums. Uh, the Taiko drums are really cool on this one. I, the horns are just uh, blasphemy. It doesn't work. Um, it's just horns are really tough. Um, it just depends on what you play, you know, uh, on what you're getting out of the device. So, again, it's kind of sound to sound. It's very... It varies in terms of quality. I like this one because it's not very difficult to do a, um, a, a spiccato, you know, for most sound engines. But once we go to legato strings, it starts to sound way more uh, synthetic, you know, or, or unreal. Um, anyway, it, and one other thing to note about the device, each one of these four bays can be loaded. So you could actually make any combination or mixture of sounds that you want playable either by one keyboard or you could actually change the MIDI channel so that they're assigned to different different keyboards or devices. Um, you can transpose on board instead of transposing MIDI. In the MIDI field, you could actually transpose uh, in real time. These also feature uh, arpeggiators, so you could actually you know arpeggiate however you want to do it. Sorry, I might switch to... And then you can just tell what kind of mode you want. Um, let's see, let's say we do. That's two octaves. I'm playing two notes, but it's up down two octaves. If I was playing one note, it's got to jump between the two, but I'm still only playing one note. Thank you. 
And again, that's just, just two note pairs at a time. So like it's, you're not even playing the full whatever that's playing. So cool, cool features built in, um, very easily accessible, easy to use. What we're gonna do today though, oh, and actually down below uh, there are effects. So you could actually you know put in a verb or a chorus or different effects actually locally. But what we're gonna do today I'm going to deactivate this is we're going to talk about the MIDI editor. So I would like for you in your steps, um, we're going to talk about editing MIDI uh, via MIDI editor. First thing you're going to need to, to know is how to get to the MIDI editor. So step one is navigate to window MIDI editor. Now once you already have MIDI in the track, you can just double click the MIDI and it'll, it'll swing you to the editor. But until then, you, essentially, you, you have to go to MIDI editor. There's also an option down at the bottom, and it's this little arrow. There's like a little arrow down here for you to actually use the MIDI editor as part of the window pane. Uh, but in most cases, this is not very functional. I mean, I have a, I'll say this, I have a, gosh, I have a large TV as my display. And it's still not very functional to use that as the MIDI editor because it's easier to it's easier to go full screen with the MIDI editor. So step one is to go to Window MIDI Editor. Step two, what we're going to actually do today is uh, in, in we're actually I'm going to have you guys actually write MIDI notes. And so what I want you to do is to choose the pencil tool in step two, and I'm going to make this full screen so it's taking up a lot more. There we go, real estate for now. You're gonna choose the pencil tool. Now notice the same tools exist up here that you see in the standard editor. Oh, hold on, maybe I'll change this because that's gonna drive me nuts. And those tools again are pencil tool, zoom tool, selector tool, the grabber tool, and there's a scrubber tool in this one. And what you're gonna see here, I'm gonna back up, just a touch is the tracks listing on the left is going to show you which which set of MIDI you're working with. So when this is filled up with MIDI, it's going to highlight for you which one you're working on and see where that pencil icon is. <clears throat> That's the one that you're actually editing. Okay, so in step two, we're going to choose the pencil tool so that we can write write in the MIDI. For those of you who just arrived, you need a new session called Class 11, and you need to create a new uh, stereo instrument track. <clears throat> So step two, you're going to choose the pencil tool. In step three, now here's the thing, okay? I'll just be honest. You could freehand all of this, but notice that we immediately start off in grid mode. And if you're in slip mode, it'll stay in slip mode, but in most cases, it'll default to grid mode. Uh, step three, please switch to grid mode. You could freehand it, but it's going to get weird, right? Because it's not going to be used to time. Now, we haven't set up... We haven't uh, set up a tempo yet, nor have we set up a click track yet, but we actually don't necessarily need one if we're going to manually write in uh, MIDI information, as long as we know what we want it to play. And that's kind of the interesting part about this. Notice that what you see in the ruler, you don't see minutes and seconds here, you see bars and beats. Now, one of the things you're going to need to do is you'll need to zoom in. So I'd say in step four, zoom in enough to make sure that you can see more resolution. In this instance, when you're in the editor, you don't have that quick zoom option here. What you have to do is you zoom along the bottom. See where this little plus icon is? Very, very bottom right. And essentially, you have to keep hitting plus or minus. What happens is, is there's a plus or minus for zooming this way, and there's a plus or minus for zooming this way once you're in the editor. This is a lot like um, several other DAWs in terms of the zoom functionality. Um, it's kind of interesting because the MIDI editor is just, just a little different than than what you're used to in the standard uh, editor. Once you're here, we switch to grid mode. So after you zoom in, in your next step, we switch to grid mode. What that means is if I go in and write a note, now notice off to the left I can audition them. All right, notice I'm there. If I want to go lower, and you can see the lane associated with it here. If I draw a note, watch what happens. In grid mode, as soon as I drop that note anywhere in the grid, it's going to make it the, the first length of the grid point. And I can then, it immediately takes me to, this, to the trim tool, and it allows me to either make it shorter or longer. But notice I can't make it any shorter than the resolution here. 
That resolution, of course, comes from over here. So what I'm actually gonna have you do for now, just to make life simple, is change your grid resolution to quarter note. So in step, I think step five, change your resolution to grid resolution to quarter note. Now I'm just gonna move that away. What I'd like for you to do today, first thing, is just build a simple, um, a simple uh, four measure phrase. So what you're gonna see is you see, in the, because it's blocked off into a quarter note, there's bar one, beat one, and then you can see one, two, three, four, there's bar two, beat one, uh, there's bar three, beat one, and then there'll be bar four, beat one. So I'm going to have you guys build a four measure phrase but you're gonna write it versus playing it. Obviously, writing it can be faster, it can be slower, just depending on a couple things. If you play, playing is probably faster. If you don't play keys at all, if you're not familiar with playing piano at all, writing actually may be faster if you have a decent ear. Uh, a couple other things, though, to, take, to keep in mind is, in some instances, writing it is actually just more efficient, even if you do play, if you already know what you want to write. So for those people who are in the, at that point, this might be beneficial as well. In most cases, you don't necessarily always write from scratch, but what you do is you use the pencil as a modifier for things that you play. So what I'm going to have you guys do is just build something simple from scratch. And if you are familiar with the keys, you can just do it in the key of C using the white keys only, right? Notice the gray, these dark gray areas represent the black keys. So you could always write something to the effect like this. So now that we're in quarter note resolution, in step six, you're just going to write... Uh, a monophonic four measure phrase. And what I mean by that, so it, it, and you can watch what I do here, but in step six, you're gonna write a monophonic four measure phrase. By monophonic, I mean that you're not gonna stack up chords. It'll just be a single note melody in, in the, in the uh, vertical. What that means is, in, is you're gonna do this. Oh, oops, sorry, I rolled it while I pulled it. Uh, sorry, that jumped down when I did it. There we go. Notice I'm not stacking them vertically. I'm moving along horizontally. You can repeat. And if you, if you guys know much about music at all, um, it's a typical pattern. The one that I'm building right now is a typical pattern. Repeat the, repeat the first measure so that you kind of create a, generate a hook, and in third measure you do something different, and then the fourth measure you do the exact same thing you did in the first and the second, which essentially is. So I'm just going to establish this melody, hit return, and play it for you. That's it. Four measure phrase, right? Pretty simple. Now. Don't, uh, I mentioned this before, just don't do this, okay? Don't, don't stack them yet. Because you can stack them so they make chords, but I don't want you doing that just yet, all right? So what I'd like for you to do now that you have those steps is I would like for you to go ahead and transition into building a simple four-measure uh, four phrase. It doesn't have to be perfect. You also, just, just FYI, I used every note, every quarter note. You don't have to. If you want to build rests in there, it's totally fine. You know, this is a really simple process procedure just to get you guys going. Cool. So you're just going to make in your in your insert, it'll be uh, an expand to a little lower in that in those gray boxes. There you go. Hold the channel. Hit hit, and then you go to instrument. To expand to the last one on the list there. Yeah. And then see if it opens. Okay, hit browse. You're just going to find the expansion folder and just hit open. Yeah. Try that. Yeah, do the first one. I don't know why there's two. Okay. And then put the menu there. There's the drop down menu there. And we went to strings. Love it. Yeah. There you go. Go to strings. Is that Kathy? Put a 
then record arm this track. Record arm your track and make sure it plays. Oh, you know what? You might have to jump over to this one. This yeah. one's, I think what they found out is the, the network line is broken oh, okay. on the floor. Okay. Yeah, if you don't mind, jump over to this one. This one seems to be working. Okay. Or was that last, last few weeks? Did you get any of those steps? Yeah, I got the steps, but how did get to it? Oh, go, uh, go to window, and then it's under your steps, and it's the video. Yeah, there you go. Miles, did you get those steps, by the way? You did, okay. Doing okay? You already done? Okay. Uh, once you're done on your first pass, what I'd like for you to do is go to the um, the edit window. Make sure you save. Create a new playlist by clicking on the playlist menu here. Hit new and do it one more time. It'll ask you like when you hit new, it'll prompt you for you know a name. You can actually just leave it as the default strings01 and then go in and write. Write another.
All right, how many of you made a second pass? How many of you made a second playlist so far? Or on your second playlist, have done it, or working on it? Okay. Um, just do a few more minutes and then we'll, we'll move to the next thing. Yes? And you're going to want to zoom in, or you may want to zoom in. It may help you to zoom in to see the resolution a little better. Yeah, there you go. Because then you can see each bar. Does that make sense? Because yeah. when you're out too far, it's, just, it's hard to read. Good? Yes. Just make a new one. Since okay. you're just going to make another idea, okay. you know, something different. You don't have to do the same thing, but maybe a second idea, alternate idea. Oh, uh, navigate to, well, you're actually going to create stereo instrument track. Did you have the part where you select the media there? Yeah, it's at the end of it. So create a stereo instrument track and then go to window MIDI editor. But, but I had walked, I manually walked everybody through picking the virtual instrument, specifically the one that I wanted for the day. So when you do it, you're going to open up expand to. Yeah, and I'll show you what, what string patch to use just to kind of make it simple for what we're doing today. Okay, so everybody's happy there? Sound cool? Did you guys make some fun stuff? You know, right? Impressive? All right, now obviously at BPM 120, on a quarter note at BPM 120, it's kind of a little slow. So, uh, but again, the beauty of it is is that you guys can manually change the tempo after the fact. You can, you can use the tap T function, or if you already know what you want, <laughs> Almost, I, I would say, like, all my faster writing always ends up between 140 and 160, you know, for me. I rarely do anything at 120. Um, but uh, in most cases, you're going to go back and go, all right, I want this particular BPM because of the feel. Um, one of the really cool parts about this, though, it, the, here's the thing that I like about this, just kind of give you some, some food for thought. One of the things that I like about this is if you have ideas or you have thoughts in terms of, of like, what you want to uh, create, you can always go back and change your virtual instrument sound after you write the MIDI. Like after your MIDI's there and it rocks, you can go back and alter it in uh, the virtual instrument. The other beneficial thing about this that you may have noticed is we don't have to quantize, right? Why don't we have to quantize in this scenario? Sonic grid already. Exactly, because it locks. It essentially locks to the grid. The one thing though that I do want you to do real quickly before we move on to the next thing, or this is kind of the next thing, but it, it's, it won't really take that long, is if you scroll down to the bottom, you'll see something called velocity. I would like you to alter your velocity. If you hover over the bottom lane right here, you can stretch it out so you can see it a little better. What I would like for you to do is simply uh, stretch it out a little bit so it's more visible. You can actually move the upper MIDI lane so that it gives you more space. Kind of see how I'm doing that in between these lanes. I'm kind of shuffling it. I'm going to shuffle this this way. What you can do with the velocity, so you notice the velocity, velocity is the pressure that's applied, okay? So in layman's terms, it's somewhat the volume or the dynamics, but the pressure that's applied on a sample instrument actually is uh, exponentially different from volume to volume, it's not simply a turning up or turning down. A lot of times on sampling engines, what they do is they'll capture samples at different volumes, and then they'll build it so that as you apply different pressures of velocity, it actually it interacts, or I should say it triggers sample, different samples to be played on the same note, which means like a great example for brass, it's very noticeable for brass, a brass player that's playing uh, just some sort of moderate volume has a different tone than a brass player who's playing full blast. And so what they do is they capture those separate samples at different stages in the dynamics, and then they apply those to, to velocity levels that are triggered from you playing the keyboard. So your velocity changes will actually be very important. What you're gonna wanna do with this is look at some op options that you have in changing velocity. The easiest way to change velocity is to go back to the pencil tool, and what you get to do here is you actually get to choose at what velocity you use. And I think if, oh, let's see if it'll let me do it this way. Oh, there we go. If you hit, all right, actually this, we might as well put this in your steps. Changing velocity in the MIDI editor. 
you're just going to open the velocity window, which is at the bottom. It's already there, so you don't have to do much. You just could expand it. But it's you know, changing velocity in the video editor. Step one, open the velocity window. Step two, choose the pencil tool. Now, I'll show you the way I like to do it, prefer to do it, is all in one sweep. Um, step three, click on one of the velocity breakpoints. It can be any one. So click one of the velocity breakpoints. It's this little ball that's at the top of the line. So click a velocity breakpoint. Click a velocity breakpoint. And then, in your next step, hit Command A. What does Command A do? Highlights them all. Highlights them all. In your final step, draw your velocity curve. Now, I say velocity curve because most of the time you do one's curve. You could actually make it random steps. You could make them alternating steps. Uh, but if you, when you hit Command A, watch how this works. Once you hit Command A, if you just literally click and drag anywhere you go along the axis here, so you just click and drag. You don't have to click on any one of them. You can just click into, into the velocity lane. And it's just going to follow your, your curve here. So if we go listen to this. And let's say we do, I'm going to try something different. I'm going to try something. This one actually, oops. Actually this one might need to go higher. Oh, there we go. So you kind of see, you hear how the volume has changed, and essentially it's just it's surging dynamically. In a four-measure phrase, it's not very noticeable necessarily, uh, but I'd like for you to just do it real quick. All I, all I want you to do is do it once so that it's done so you can kind of get used to it. Uh, but then I'm going to talk about a little bit more about it. Uh, okay, so you're, you're going to go to Window, Video Editor, and then I just want you to change this. Uh, there's a little menu right there. Yeah, change it to Strings. Down the middle. There you go. There you go. Yep. And then go to your staccato strings up and down. There you go. And then, yep. And then you're good. You should be able to record and able to track so you can hear it. And then you can do it. Sorry. And then you can switch to your. Oh, your pencil tool's on. You just need to get rid of the minutes and seconds view. If you click on that window right there, that little icon. Yeah. Uh, oh, sorry. You're going to have to switch. Move the window, grab the window, move it out of the way. You're in the encounter right now. So it's like it's easy. It's easy. Yeah, just grab, grab the top here, slide it down. Yeah, and switch to this. That makes the bars piece. Yeah, and then you can go back to the other. All right, you get the minutes and seconds from that. You can drop that. Oh, did it click again? Oh, I think it's on. Oh, put it on bar piece. Yeah. Now you're looking at quarter notes, so you can see the quarter note lane, so you can draw in your idea of the quarter note. Does that make sense? Make sure, make sure you hear sound when, you do, when you're doing it. So, All right, that's pretty simple, right, for the most part? Well, when you're in the command A range, one easy thing that, you, that happens a lot is, is that I notice is like, is it overall too loud? Is it overall too soft? So you can actually grab the whole group. And why might this be a reason or a, a reason that we need to look at it is because when you're doing a mix down, sometimes the, the appropriate move is, is not to turn the fader down or turn the, the, the volume down. Sometimes the appropriate move is to adjust the velocity because the tone changes. Because um, otherwise it just sounds like you turned it down versus you actually uh, enacting different sample stages by using these velocities. For the expand to, there's not a lot of velocity variables. And as soon as you go into uh, like LA scoring strings or using any of the native instrument plugins, um, they're all designed to activate uh, different samples at different velocity levels. So it's, so it's actually a huge 
thing for you dynamically to be able to do this instead of letting them just be stagnant. The benefit of the samples that we use with the up-down bow actually gave us alternating sounds anyway, but if we had a simple device that didn't have that up-down alternating, it'd be way more uh, apparent that the velocities were the same. They kind of just flatlined, right? So that's an easy thing for you to do. What I'd also like you to do real quickly is go to your playlist. Actually, you know what? I'm just going to, I'll make this a simple step. It's going to be super easy. This is manual transposition in the media. I'm sure you can probably figure out where, how, how you might do this. Manual, transpos manual transposition in the MIDI editor. Manual transposition, most of you know what transposing is, but if you're unaware, all it is is it's the shifting from one key signature to another um, by moving the notes as a group, respectively, to the new key. To manually transpose, step one, and I always recommend this as a, when you transpose, is duplicate the playlist. You can duplicate your latest playlist. Uh, you don't have to do your first unless you want to duplicate your first or use your first. But all you're going to do is go into your playlist menu and hit duplicate. So step one, we're going to duplicate the playlist. Why, why might we duplicate the playlist? We may not like it. Exactly. We, we, we want, a, we want a, a way to go back to the original version just in case. I've had, I've had like... I had a band come in uh, a long time ago, and they're like, well, we just finished recording, but we don't like it. The vocalist is about to sing. He prefers that we move it up a full step. And I'm like, okay, but this is all live instrument stuff, so we can keep the drums. Everything else has to be re-recorded. You know, uh, what we did with that is in the session is we essentially just keep a version of the original so that we can go back to it. We did it in two ways. We used the one, the save as option in the original key. And then we did some, you know, along the way, we just uh, create new playlists so that we still have the original playlist before we alternate the key. Because here's the thing. If a band comes into the studio and spent all this time recording in one key, and then all of a sudden they want to change to another key, it's very possible that at the end of all that, the singer may get in there and go, you know, I like the, the original key better. Can we just go back to that? Right? And that, and that kind of stuff happens. But... Keeping your original playlist will help you a lot. So what we're going to do is go to the MIDI editor. In your next step, go to MIDI editor. Oh, I'm sorry. Anytime that you do a dupe, you'll get the dialog. You can just hit OK. It just says, do you want to rename it? In this instance, if you wanted to really be like, if you knew where you were going, you could call this uh, strings transposed. You know, if you know what key you're going into, you might call it that key, just so you can keep track of the playlist. You're going to go to Window, MIDI editor, and then... What might you expect would be the first thing you want to do here? We're going to switch to the grabber tool. Okay, so in your next step, switch to the grabber tool. Switch to the grabber tool. In your next step, hit Command A because we're going to transpose all. Okay, so you hit Command A so we have all MIDI. In your final step, you're just going to use the grabber tool, click, and drag to the new transpose position. So it depends on what you want to do with it. A lot of times, the easiest way to know what you're doing with your transposition is just to watch the first note. You're going to hear a lot of crazy things happen when this, when this moves, but you kind of have to ignore that. Focus on what happens with the first note, so watch what happens here. So I'm going to go to the grabber, hit Command A, grab the first note, and let's say I want to move up a full step. A full step is two half steps combined, so here's one half step, here's another half step, which means that if I hit Command A, uh, my goal is for my first note to end up right there. Does that make sense? Did you guys see that? So this is my original position. There's my transposed position. Now, why this becomes beneficial, I'll just tell you that modulating a lot of times when you're writing things like that is actually quite beneficial. And let me show you. Um, this is, I'm going to have you guys transpose, but let me just show this to you real quick. Uh, oh, for some reason, something's up with this. Okay. So notice I had my original up here.
Did you notice what happened along the way? Essentially, just transposing along the way. When a lot of, for any of you that are really into writing music like this or working in, in music like this, it becomes a really quick step to manually transpose in groups to be able to make shifts or changes or modulations to what's happening in the music. Um, what I'd like for you to do is to just follow those steps. You can choose any way to transpose, either up or down or any location. I just want you to do it once very quickly, but uh, make sure you start with step one, duplicating the original playlist. Sorry, I didn't get your, oh, you did your sound set. Did you record your original video? Uh, no. Oh, you're working on it. Okay, yeah. How are we doing? You guys made that, that happen? Not too difficult, right? But of course, kind of fun, you know, there's a lot of options you can make happen with that. Very, just quick, easy moves, right? Now, as you would expect, you can trim, if you were to move to slip or change the grid, you can trim and adjust, you know, things uh, in terms of the MIDI duration, just as you normally would. Um, you can also duplicate groups of notes. It's very interesting if you wanted to, let's see, instead of doing this, if you, instead of doing them note by note, like you could crab a range, you could go in and choose specific notes. And you're like, oh, you know what? I'm just going to shift all of these instead of everybody. Right, not too bad. The other thing is, is um, what I always, you know, you wouldn't necessarily do this in the same lane, uh, but if you had a new instrument track, let me just show this to you. I'm just going to duplicate the track so you can see a duplicated track without the active playlist or the alternate. I'm just going to show this again just so you can see what you could do here with the editor. In the editor, know that, notice that there's two, there are now two in the listing, there's two different instruments. Well, you have to isolate or, or designate which one you're actually writing to. Well, the one weird part about this is when they're both viewed, you're actually seeing both at the same time, which means if they have, and you just you know take them out of view with the little dot here, but if they have alternate parts, alternating parts, they'll actually still show in the same lane. Um, so it just you have to keep an eye on which one is actually being edited, which is based upon the little pencil tool. So like in the second part, I don't even have any MIDI. You know, but if I went in and wrote some MIDI, uh, let's say I did it. Now, watch what happens here. If I go in and I deselect this view from the first track, I only see the second track. And vice versa. If I go back to this one, I only see the first track, but combined, this is what they look like. So I'm actually, it's not a single MIDI lane, it's actually multiple MIDI lanes from multiple instruments. And then of course you can do the same thing here, you know, dupe and move. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank 
Okay, so now where we're going next, it's interesting where we go next, is, is we're going to go to the score editor. So this kind of gives you a different view option. Now, obviously, we manually recorded all this. When you physically play all this, it still ends up in, this, in the MIDI editor, and then you can go make modifications. When we actually look at the one al alternative here, it's the score editor. So in your notes, um, first, the first thing you're going to put is viewing notes in the MIDI editor. We're going to start with viewing notes in the MIDI editor, and then we'll move to the score editor. So viewing notes in the MIDI editor, it's actually quite simple. There's just a little icon here. You're just going to activate the notation display enable button. It looks, you might want to draw this symbol on your, in your notes. It looks like a little note, but it's in the MIDI editor. So you, you only gain access to this from the MIDI editor. So all you do is click it and watch what happens. It'll, you guys, it'll, when the first time it does it, it'll take a moment. The, once it's done, this is what it looks like. Now, the great part about this, and actually, I'll open up my second part so you can see those two combined. The great part about this, actually, I'll take that away for now, is if you're great with notes, this makes it even faster if you just want to write in notation. If you're not great with notes, this helps you actually have notation if you needed it for someone to actually play it. So like, you know, um, years ago, I was working on an album, and it was my first my first time working with live strings. So what did I do? I went into Pro Tools, I wrote all the string parts, I actually wrote them in, in Reason, I imported them into Pro Tools, I took that import from Pro Tools, and I moved it to Notation uh, Display or Notation View, and then I was able to actually modify or edit the notation, print this out, and hand it to a real string player to actually perform the thing that was originally a MIDI piece or, or a virtual instrument. And essentially that's, a one easy workaround if you don't want to have to use something like Sibelius or Finale from the get-go. And, and the cool part about it is, is it's built into Pro Tools. It's also built into Logic. Um, you can gain access to it, I think, in um, uh, what's that other one? New, uh, New Window. There's a lot of other DAWs that now offer notation elements that allow you to just transition from having MIDI to, to actually having notation. The messy part about it, when you guys all exported your MIDI, when you export your MIDI and you then take it to um, Sibelius or Finale, the notation software, you then have to resort out a lot of different things when you get there. One of the most annoying things typically is how it sounds uh, because then all of a sudden you're working with sound sets that are in those devices which don't typically sound very good and they're kind of annoying for you to listen to and they, get, they make it very hard for you to get a realistic picture of what is this supposed to be like, especially if you transition it from something where you already like the sounds and then you're moving it to that. And, you know, so there's a, a few things that become a little cumbersome. So it's nice to have a MIDI or a notation editor in the window. From here, you could easily just go and move things as normal, just as you as you would before. You know, wherever you want it. What becomes a little different here is again how you import or uh, you input MIDI notes. Then it becomes specifically in the way that it was earlier based upon your resolution selection. You know, um, so you have to be mindful of how and which notes are, are being applied and where you place them. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have you, I'm sorry, it's this one right here. I'm going to have you um, move to window score editor, if you can. So in your next step, you could just put editing, uh, editing MIDI in the score editor, and you're going to go to step one, window, score editor. Now you may have to kind of zoom around to be able to access, you know, some of the stuff uh, because you're probably immediately like mine. It was like blown out, um, like all the way at first. Um, when you're working with notes in the score editor, you can actually manually write them in just the same way we had done it before. Let me move here. Here we go. 
The only catch here is is that what you first off you begin to see both treble and bass clap. And this a lot of times is not beneficial for anybody who's not a piano player. Um, where piano music has both clefs listed, if you're writing for or working for an instrument that only plays on one clef, a great example, you're just you're writing something for a trumpet player to play, they're not gonna be needing both clefs, so everything you write has to stay on one clef. So your first move here, or your second step, as I should say, is to uh, right click, uh, actually, maybe I would be able to do it from here. I'm sorry, it's going to have to be from this list, I think. Yeah. Actually, you're going to have to click the Tracks menu. Click the Tracks menu. It's this little drop down where it shows tracks. And you're going to Notation, Display, Track Settings. Notation, Display, Track Settings. All, all we have to do is tell it a couple things. It was actually quite helpful and very easy to use. Notation, display, track settings. All we're going to do is tell it which clef we want. Immediately, you'll see, first thing you see here is which track we're on. So, like, it'll you can switch between tracks. But in the clef, it just says which clef do you want. In most cases, you want treble. If you're writing for specific instruments, you may need to look it up, um, like which instruments are using which clef. If you're writing for, like, strings, uh, you're going to have to make some changes for things like viola, um, certain cello players, and, of course, bass. Uh, but in most cases, a lot of times you're going to be in treble clef C. Here's what's also really cool about this. See where it says display transposition? Display transposition is not the played transposition. It's just the displayable transposition, which means when, when I push play and I adjust this, nothing changes audibly. The only difference here is that this gives you the ability, if you had a part that was like written way high off the clef, you could essentially drop it so that it fit inside of the clef better. Uh, there it goes. Well, for example, if you wrote something that was too low on the clef like this, you'd just be able to bring it up so that it fit inside the clef so it was easy to read. All you have to then do is notate to the player, oh yeah, this is actually performed an octave down, but for visibility and readability, it's written on the clef. Um, and then another easy thing here is down, it's kind of weird how they did this, but, but uh, it's, it's a very smart functionality, display quantization. You guys wrote on the grid, which was nice, no quantization required. But if you had just kind of free done it, you know, just freehanded it, just kind of worked with the click a little bit, but you weren't like super tight and you didn't go back around and quantize, you could actually tell the display, just what you see on the score, to be quantized to a specific note value. Um, I'll switch to bar, you'll see. I switched the display for one bar, which means every note that fit inside the bar just got stacked. But, you know, essentially we don't need that because we already wrote to quarter note. But it allows us to, to, to essentially kind of clean up the, what, the visual before you get there. The other thing here is, is a lot of people are like, well, what about, what about what, you know, what key we're in and all that kind of stuff. Well, that actually happens, and I don't. We haven't really talked about that a whole lot. Um, we haven't set up a key signature uh, in this this whole scenario. There's not a real need for it under certain circumstances, but when we do, when when the rubber meets the road, we will eventually be required to put a key signature in. If let's say this is not in the standard key of C, um, and although let's see, it weird. It shows it in the menus. We haven't used it yet in this in this bar uh, in the ruler view, but you can see as a default, it's we start off in the key of C. If we were to hit the little plus sign over here, it gives us all keys that we'd like based upon the key signature. For those of you who are familiar with this, um, you kind of may follow along with what key is here. The the weird part about this is is when we add oh, let's not let me drag it when we add a key signature. We, it does not, in this instance, it does not transpose the MIDI. So at, unlike tempo changes where tempo moves the MIDI, key changes or key signatures that are added to the song don't actually alter the MIDI itself. But going back to the score editor itself, what I'd like for you to do, oh, sorry, let me undo that a couple times. So 
what I'd like for you to do in the, in the score editor is go to your strings again and create a new track. So in your next step, you're just going to go ahead and hit new for a uh, new playlist. Sorry, not a new track, but a new playlist. You'll go to your score editor, choose your pencil tool. And this time, instead of, instead of writing it as a, um, as a MIDI note, the way you had done before in, in MIDI, you're actually just going to go ahead and write a part via score. You'll notice immediately when you drop them down that the rests appear for the measure. So if you did want a, a, some sort of uh, gap there, you could easily put it there as well. And then let's see if we move to oh, this one's wrong one. I'm going to have you guys build another four measure phrase. You can easily see one, two, three, and four. You guys can go ahead and start following those steps. When you're done, raise your hand. Um, I'm actually going to have you, uh, instead of building a new playlist to do an extended four measures, I'm going to have you build four measures and then build another four measures in the same grouping. So you'll end up with eight. But first start on your first four and then we'll move to the next four. Good. Not too difficult, at least this part. Let's alternating. Let's
Okay, how do we do with that? Now, in the same way, if you switch back to your editor, um, if you go back to your edit view, what you'll see is as you're creating MIDI, it's doing it or it's dropping it into the edit window. So, like, as you're building your performance here, it's actually writing it down here in MIDI. Uh, and the, the benefit there is, is that if, you, if you're into, like, developing, um, like, you know, compositions and things like that, in the score editor, if you're, if you're good at notation in that uh, form, you could easily just go in and make small um, uh, four-measure phrases or eight-bar phrases, go back to the playlist and go to new and just keep building um, some sort of uh, palette of ideas before you actually move forward with one. And so these are actually quite beneficial in that kind of form. The other thing that's beneficial in that form is when you're looking at it on a notation view, it's a lot easier to figure out chords if you're familiar with chords. So if you did want to start to stack stuff, essentially you have the ability to actually build like elongated or not elongated but but vertical chords like multiple pitch kind of stuff the other thing you could do of course is is um, arpeggios are a little easier to come by from from this vantage point view because you know if any of you guys remember uh, just basic uh, rudimentary theory Now, what I'd like to do for the last, just for the last part of class today, is I want to go back to the I, to the actual expand, and I want to talk again a little bit. I showed it to you at the beginning, a little bit about some of the options that you have here. What I'd like for you to do is I'd like for you to go to. Uh, you don't have to write this down, but I'd like for you to go to Options, Loop Playback, to loop to loop the playback of your performance. What I would like for you to do is modify the expand to your liking or to taste, and you could even change your sounds, but I want to show you some of the options that you have here. After you've done a loop playback, please go and select your MIDI clip. So I'm going to go back a couple playlists on mine. Actually, I think I like the first one better anyway. Select your, your playlist. What happens is, is after you select the actual clip, it'll just keep coming back around. And it's best to loop it so that you can go into the expand and just figure out, well, do I like the sound? Are there other things that I want? Um, so you might immediately want to go in and kind of see what other kinds of sounds you have here. Um, I mean, there's a lot of different stuff, but... Ooh, okay, maybe not that. Let's see. What else do we have? That's fun. That's literally just wind. Well, I mean, and then once you choose something, there's a couple of options you have here. You can see, obviously, there's a level, panners, and then there's effects one and two. You can actually come down and change the effects. Down at the bottom, you click on the effects name. Let's say we went with, this one already has a bit of a delay on it, but maybe I want to intensify that. Uh, let's see what we can come up with. And then activate it here in effects one, turn up effects one.
And then you can see overall there's some things you can do with the ADSR, attack, decay, sustain, and release. There's also a mod option for each one. And you can change the rate and tell it what kind of mods you're going to do with it. So let's say we did... Uh, And then, of course, you can stack these, like I had mentioned before, so you can just jump in and start adding stuff. Transpose this a little bit. to do is I want you to go ahead and loop yours, roll it around, start modifying your expand. 